Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Wecker, and I'm the president and CEO of the Pacific Northwest Research Institute, or PNRI. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's event, um, which is part of a series that we call Science Matters. Now, originally, we had thought we would be doing this at the Washington Athletic Club, but you know how that story goes. Uh, by now, I trust that everyone's become somewhat comfortable with these video technology platforms, and I hope that our virtual event goes off without a hitch. Um, just a quick housekeeping note, uh, at the end of today's discussion, we hope to have some time to uh, answer some of the questions from you, the audience. Um, if you wanna pose a question, please use the um, uh, Q&A function on Zoom, and uh, please feel free to post a question whenever you'd like during the course of the discussion. So before I, introduce today's guest, I wanna give you just a brief introduction to PNRI. PNRI is um, the oldest independent biomedical research institute here in Seattle. We were founded back in 1956 by Dr. William Hutchinson. Dr. Hutchinson founded our institute on a relatively simple but very powerful mission, which was to provide an environment for talented and passionate researchers to conduct biomedical research in a supportive and enabling environment. Dr. Hutchinson was a physician and an oncologist, and he had seen the medical impact uh, coming through breakthroughs, medical breakthroughs. And at the same time, he understood that for every one of those breakthroughs, they owed their success to a basic research discovery occurring in some laboratory years and years before that breakthrough actually was delivered and delivered the impact. So today, our scientists continue to be very inspired uh, by Dr. Hutchinson's vision. They recognize that the discoveries they make today in their laboratories hold the potential to be tomorrow's medical breakthroughs. And I think there's um, nowhere where this fact is more evident than uh, the situation we find ourselves in today with our response to the coronavirus pandemic and COVID-19. Um, I know that each morning I wake and I search the news for the latest information on the development of new diagnostics, or therapies, or maybe even a vaccine. But even the fact that we can imagine these possibilities is due to um, a laboratory discovery that was made in a basic research um, environment many, many years before the pandemic arose. So science has been thrust into the limelight uh, today as a result of COVID-19. And for me, it raises questions such as, who are these men and women of science and what is it that they do? So I'm very pleased to have a guest today, Dr. David Gallus, who's a member of our faculty, will help give us some insight into those questions. Um, if I was to give uh, uh, adequate time to describe David's illustrious and long career, I'm afraid it would take up most of the next 20 minutes. So I'm just gonna offer a few descriptors um, that I think are apropos to uh, David's uh, long professional career. A mathematician, physicist, biologist, geneticist, entrepreneur, public servant. So with a list like that, I think there's a lot to talk about. So um, let's get started. Well, David, it's good to see you, even if it is in two dimensions. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us today. I am sure that the audience will very much appreciate uh, what you have to share with us today. Great to be here. Good. Well, I wanna start basically at the beginning. I, I know um, we've talked many times around the fact that you um, have an innate curiosity um, and, uh, that curiosity has been a major driver for you during your professional career. And there's a story that you tell from your childhood and that I hope that you'll be willing to share with us today that, that illustrates um, uh, or is an expression, I think, of, of, of that um, innate curiosity. Would you mind sharing that story? Well, let me, yeah, let me make a few comments about that because this, our theme is uh, curiosity as a driver. So, and I think this is true of many scientists, but it certainly was true for me, is that the curiosity that uh, the, the seeds really began very, very early in, uh, in my childhood when, and I think the very first um, things that I was concerned with was just observing nature and wondering about birds and animals and and you know wandering around in the 
woods and fields where I lived. And that was really the first. Um, I think those are the seeds of curiosity. But uh, I think it really was catalyzed in heart science when my, uh, my parents gave me a chemistry set very, very early on. And, uh, and I think that's, uh, that often happens. Kids start playing around with something and all of a sudden you wonder, why does this do that? What is, uh, you know, how? And so curiosity in some fundamental sense really is wondering how things work. You observe, you know a few things, you try to put them together into a picture of how things work. And I think that carries on through into uh, a research career. Yeah. Well, this, the story you're referring to is after I, uh, after I uh, uh, got interested in chemistry, <laughs> I, uh, I discovered that my father had a bunch of books on his bookshelf, one of them, was a chemistry book from his college chemistry book, which I think at the age of uh, nine or 10, I decided I really wanted to know how things work. So I pulled down that chemistry book and spent a lot of time reading it. And uh, I'm not sure how much chemistry I learned, but it really whetted my appetite for trying to figure out how things really work and these things called atoms and these, <laughs> and how things, fit together. And then I think the story you're referring to is uh, right next to, uh, I was very interested in mathematics as well, as many, many scientists uh, learn to be. Um, and uh, right next to the chemistry book, there was a, a calculus book. So I think this, the story you're referring to that I told you was one summer when we were taking a cross country trip by took the calculus book with me for our drive from East Coast to West Coast. And I think that was about the age of 10. And I, I decided I would learn calculus. And so I started reading that book. Um, again, I'm not sure how much calculus I learned, but I, I did learn enough to really whet my appetite. <laughs> so I think this happens to a lot of scientists when the curiosity bug is, uh, you want to know how things work and what you can do from chemistry and numbers and everything. It, it really does begin to change the way you look at the world. Yeah. No, thanks a lot for sharing. I do really enjoy that story. And I know that, the, that innate curiosity uh, through your career, you, you really um, directed it towards uh, the pursuit of, of unraveling complexity. I think you're, you really enjoy looking into complexity, whether it's the physical, physical world we live in or human biology. So I'm wondering, what, what is it about complexity that, that, that so attracts you and, and excites you? Well, that's a really interesting question. I wish I could answer that in detail, but it's a, it's a, it's, it's a complex uh, issue, complexity. <laughs> <laughs> but the point really is that once I really got interested in biology, it is. It becomes abundantly clear that everything that you're concerned with in biology is remarkably complex. Mm -hmm. Cells and organisms and uh, and even ecosystems. Um, if you even begin to try to understand them, you have to deal with so many different components and parts that are that are interacting. And so um, that was probably the first thing to just grapple with. If I was going from being a physicist to being a biologist. So what is it about biology? And, and probably trying to understand how a complex system emerges from all the component parts is one of the most fascinating things to many biologists, and it certainly caught my imagination. Catching one's imagination and wondering how things work, of course, that is... Uh, curiosity, but of course, that's not enough. <laughs> you can't just sit around and wonder how things work and hope to learn how things work. And so, you know, this brings up the question that you and I've discussed uh, from time to time, and that is, so while curiosity is a driver and a motivator in some sense, 
um, which we can talk about more later, the question really is, how do you actually do science? How do you actually find out how things work? And I think one of the things that most people don't realize is that one of the most important and critical pieces of that is formulating questions, asking the right questions. And that, you know, you bring together pieces of things you know, and you say, is that a paradox? Does that make any sense? How does this work? How does that interact with this? And so forth and so on. But it's asking those questions and then, and the questions being a good question is uh, the characteristic of a good question is one that you can make observations or do experiments to actually answer. And that is often a very difficult thing to do. And so sometimes it's said that the very best scientists are the ones that formulate the best questions. Um, and they're often driven by curiosity, but curiosity doesn't give you those questions. You have to think about yeah. asking them. Yeah, actually, that that, that brings up a, you know, something that is a is someone who used to be a scientist or was like that, like that was a scientist. Um, you know, the idea that you pose those questions, you design experiments um, uh, to help answer those questions, you run these experiments, and then it's not always the case that you get the answer you want or 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 maybe the experiment didn't work um uh and very yet common. you go back is very common and you go back in the lab again and try again and try again so there's a there's a there's a yeah there's something in the temperament of a scientist to continue on and on and on even in the face of of, of what might be you know frustration and disappointment so do you, did you have you experienced that Oh, sure. Every scientist does. And I think the point that um, is really important here is the curiosity, in some sense, wanting to know how it works is something that drives the persistence to ask those questions, modify those questions, keep doing the experiments, keep doing the observations, and interacting with other scientists who are making observations and interacting and, and, and asking other questions. It is a, uh, it is a, uh, an amazing enterprise science. Being driven by curiosity, I think is a, is a key thing, but um, understanding really what that means, it drives asking questions, but it also drives, I want to know how that works. So I'm going to keep at this. <laughs> Well, well, thanks for sharing it. And, and I, 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 you know, you spent many years uh, in several positions acad in academic uh, institutions of higher learning. So I'm sure you've you've had plenty of opportunity to hone those skills. Um, and but you've also spent some time in the private sector. In fact, you've uh, started a couple companies uh, over the years. Uh, perhaps five, most, actually. Over five, on. okay. Yeah, but including one here in uh, well, in Bellevue, Darwin Molecular, many yeah. a few years ago. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the, the role of the private sector in, um, in, in helping realize the potential of the discoveries that occur in basic uh, science laboratories. Yeah, there's a lot to be said about how the different sectors of uh, academia and uh, private research institutions, the private sector that is in companies and the governmental sector it largely focuses, although not entirely, on making sure that that science is enabled and funded. Um, it, is a, it is a really interesting complex, but I think on the public sector, probably the way I think about that most often is that the, the boundaries between commercializing something or what is appropriate to commercialize, um, sometimes those decisions are difficult. Sometimes a lot of people get them wrong and so forth. But on the other hand, once the discoveries are made to impact society, the principal way that that actually happens is through the, uh, uh, through the private sector, through commercialization, through patents and uh, products that are produced based on the knowledge that 
uh, is produced in the laboratories uh, around the country, around the world. So in some sense, it's, um, it's, it's kind of the end game in a sense to impact society, to provide the therapeutics, diagnostics and other components of, uh, uh, of what makes society work and makes the healthcare system function. Yeah. Well, you know, there, you, as you well know, you, you've made a little news. I've been in the news recently. Um, there was a technology I know you developed oh, almost 20 years ago um, um, that, um, uh, if I remember the story correctly, it was originally funded to, to look into uh, the development of a diagnostic for anthrax. For those of you on, in the audience who remember the anthrax scares days. Um, uh, over time, that technology was, you know, passed through many hands uh, and eventually ended up in, in the hands of Abbott Pharmaceuticals. They developed a, a point of care diagnostic test using that technology for COVID-19. I know you were not involved at all in, in the development of the particular device, but I wonder if you just share um, a little bit about that technology and, uh, uh, you know, just the story around the development of that. Um, right. I think there's some interesting lessons there that I would like to try to convey to people. The, uh, so first of all, what we were really researching when we uh, developed that technology or discovered it was, um, was actually pretty basic work on nucleic acid uh, biophysical chemistry uh, trying to, and what we were really interested in at the time was developing ways to distinguish single pair differences in genetic material to do genetics. Mm -hmm. And by studying the, uh, you know, the biophysical chemistry of, uh, of DNA, we stumbled across a way, I had some ideas, uh, that's probably the right way to put it. We had some ideas and hey, we could we could advance things at the time, which was, um, you know, around the couple years around the year 2000. The uh, the only way to uh, to do that kind of uh, of, of thing uh, um, in a really sensitive way was to use uh, the polymerase chain reaction PCR, which is still used. Um, that's a technology for those of you who don't know it that uh, allows the amplification of a short sequence of DNA um, and was awarded a Nobel Prize. It turned out to be a very, very powerful thing. But one of the things that PCR requires is a machine to raise the temperature of the reaction and decrease the temperature and do that in a cyclic fashion. And so having a, uh, having a really simple uh, and fast and portable and flexible thing, uh, you can't really carry a PCR machine around with you. So what we were trying to do and what we, our ideas were, we could make a uh, one that could, uh, a reaction that could do the same thing effectively but at a single temperature and in a single small test tube. And so that was, that was what we were trying to do. And so after those ideas seemed to work, um, then we did three things as you, you'll understand are necessary. One is to, uh, um, to write a paper and at the same time file a patent because it looked like a very powerful methodology. And the third thing was to uh, think about how I could get this work, further work supported. And so because, as you mentioned at the time, um, what uh, a lot of the federal government was worried about was uh, bioterrorism and bio biological threat agents like anthrax you may recall that was in the paper of people where somebody was sending anthrax spores through the mail. Um, so those kinds of things, finding something that could rapidly and reliably uh, do that, uh, detect and, and identify specific agents, whether it be a virus or a, I think was something that DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, uh, 
ought to be interested in, I thought. So we went to DARPA and uh, I talked to them and they liked the proposal. And um, so they ended up funding the basic science around the development of this technology. And they had their purposes, but they didn't fund uh, really the, the development of some assay for anthrax. What they, what they funded, which was really important, was the basic scientific research that underlay the technological ideas that we had that seemed to be promising. And then shortly after that, when it seemed to work really well, we, uh, I started a company which uh, uh, developed a number of applications uh, for this kind of technology. And then, as you said, there's a long story. The technology was developed. The company was acquired by uh, Inverness or Lear, and uh, they wanted, they were a diagnostics company so they wanted to explore the biomedical uh, diagnostic applications. And so the team that was the company actually developed three uh, assays for flu, for strep A bacteria, and for RSV, which is a respiratory syncytial virus, which is a very common virus among kids. Uh, so those were, those were the first real assays and those were developed in a commercial setting in the Lear. And then subsequently, as you described, it was uh, that company was acquired by Abbott. And uh, as we saw last month, uh, Abbott then probably many of the same team uh, developed the uh, coronavirus assay, which and actually, from what I know about the technology, it's in principle, if properly used and uh, properly manufactured, is very accurate, very sensitive, and uh, only takes a couple months once you know the sequence. Yeah. And so we had the sequence, uh, the world had the sequence of the coronavirus uh, probably three months ago. So it's about, it sounds like it's about, <laughs> yeah. it no, it's, didn't it's, take that long. Yeah, no, it's a very illustrative story. Um, basic science fueled by curiosity <laughs> and trying to solve a particular problem, um, supported by federal funding, our, our tax dollars, um, at a time when you had no idea <laughs> that one day it would be a breakthrough in a pandemic. Um, you know, and it took almost 20 years. And it, it reminds me that we oftentimes think about science and, and particularly the translation of science into um, some, um, some, some sort of breakthrough. It's really a, a marathon and, and not a sprint. And yeah. even to, to beat that analogy, it's a marathon where you're not even sure where the, where the finish line is, but um, you keep on going and uh, sometimes it leads to places that you could never yeah. imagine. I think that's a very good point. We don't know how knowledge or even the basic underlying ideas for this technology could be uh, could be applied. And so this really underlies how important the funding of fundamental science is in this country, because uh, as we've said, yeah. downstream, and it's also the training of the people that worked in my laboratory at the time, the people in the company who, uh, who developed these things and are now in, the, in other companies. Uh, it is a, uh, it really plants the fundamental seeds for the future. And if you wait until you know it's needed, <laughs> that is not a good plan because uh, this took 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> Well, speaking of that intersection again of, of, of basic science and uh, federal support, funding support for, for something that's ultimately a, a public good, you um, were at the Department of Energy during uh, the Human Genome Project. In fact, the Department of Energy was a major funder. I know you played a, a critical role in that project. Um, just wondering if there's any kind of stories or lessons that you wanna share about uh. that experience. Well, that was, that was certainly an exciting time in my career to be in charge of a program, uh, a 
a component of which was uh, the Department of Energy's piece of the Genome Project. The Genome Project itself, one of the reasons that I actually left my academic job for three years and took a leave and went to the government was that I finally realized as this began to come together that the Genome Project was only going to happen once ever. And uh, having the opportunity to participate in that uh, is truly a remarkable one. And uh, to have contributed anything at all to that is just incredibly gratifying, in addition to all the people and uh, all the places. But I should say, I mean, apropos of our previous discussion about funding, the uh, the office uh, that I ran and I uh, was in charge of in the Department of Energy had many, many different programs. The Genome Project component with NIH was just one, uh, but overall the funding of a number of different things in uh, understanding the effects of radiation, basic science on uh, uh, in a large number of different areas, including various kinds of biotechnology and environmental things, including climate change, by the way. We had a big climate change program. And so I, I do understand how government funding is done because uh, the budget that I had, the yearly budget that I had for that, for example, was, was about, by the time I left, was about $500 million a year which is a substantial uh, a budget to keep an awful lot of really interesting science going. And we were funding a number of projects at national laboratories, at universities, and at private institutions. Uh, and uh, I must say um, that is, I'm sympathetic with people that uh, are that are in the government that have to have to do this because it's not easy to do it well, yeah. but it's incredibly gratifying and you can really understand. I spent three years there in Washington and understood very well by the time I left uh, how how things develop in various areas and uh, it the examples there are just just terrific. Yeah. And for the genome project, I have lots of stories, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. For but, another, another uh, let's, let's not, uh, yeah. Yeah, another conversation, because I do want to give you a chance um, to talk a little bit about the things that are most near and dear to your heart now. Uh, I know there's a couple projects you've been working on for, for many years, including the last several years at PNRI. And um, I just give you a chance to share maybe about either the small RNA work you do or the... Uh, uh, with the computational methodology, just so yeah, we'd love to hear what what, what are you doing today? What <laughs> what's what's happening, David? Okay, well let me yeah let me just say a little about those. And apropos of our context here, so let me talk about the small RNA things. And that was really really was driven by curiosity. Um, so it was about fifteen to 20 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, that these small RNAs were discovered in cells. Yeah, well, it's probably you, 20 have, years ago. You, you yeah. probably have to help people understand. Yeah, and they, know, they're they really RNA. small pieces of RNA, which now RNA is the, uh, is the uh, molecule that is essentially, it's like a, a, a tape that you, it's used, DNA is copied into RNA and the RNA is used to code for proteins, but it does a whole bunch of other things as well. And people were beginning to understand this about 20 years ago, particularly the roles of some of these really small pieces of RNA that were regulating the expression of different genes. So that was a fascinating new area, but the, the curiosity came from an observation that we and other laboratories made when we looked into uh, human plasma, which is the, uh, the non-cell part of blood, just the, uh, the liquid uh, 
component, and we saw lots of small RNAs circulating throughout the body. And this raised a lot of questions, and here's, the, here's where the curiosity comes in. And how does this work? What is going on? Uh, if these are, and we realized, and several other labs showed that sometimes these RNAs can leave one cell, go into the blood, and then circulate, and then go into other cells. Since we know they regulate genes, what this means is the potential for transmitting information between cells in the body by this wholly unstudied new system was just a marvelous possible thing we needed to understand. We wanted to understand how the body work. It's kind of like the endocrine system with hormones going from one cell to another, but these are pieces of RNA that are moving from cell to cell. And there's now lots of examples that, um, uh, that show how some of these regulatory things work. So we began studying uh, this just because we wanted to know what those RNAs were doing and what could be going on. And the first thing we actually stumbled across is we looked at um, uh, some samples actually in mice to begin with, that had been treated uh, with uh, Tylenol to uh, damage their livers. As you may know, <laughs> most of the liver damage uh, in the United States or around uh, the world, if it's not done by uh, too much alcohol, it's too much Tylenol. It, it's actually very dangerous. Uh, so anyway, we looked in these mice and we found some specific RNAs, small RNAs, that were uh, present only if the mice had been treated by Tylenol and they appeared immediately. And so this was what some people in the biomedical community would call perhaps a biomarker for liver damage. And so we thought, well, this is interesting. Are small RNAs, can they be used for other kinds of uh, indications of things going wrong in the body? In many labs, including one or the colleague who was then at the Fred Hutch, discovered that some cancers release small RNAs, for example. And anyway, we've, we've done a lot of work now and found a number of these, but many, many labs around the, uh, the country have now begun to study how micro, small microRNAs work and how they get uh, exported into the blood, how they move around to other cells, and how they can be potentially used as diagnostics, which is potentially a very, very interesting thing because it does potentially tell you, although this potential has not yet been realized fully, but it's, it's, it's a very exciting area of research in biomedical diagnostics. Uh, it's, uh, it's complex. Uh, and, and, and perhaps just to whet the appetite uh, for our audience in a future discussion, if I remember correctly, you can also find some small RNAs from, um, yeah, the creatures in our microbiome floating around in our own blood system. Isn't, is, that, is, that, is that true? That is true. Um, it turns out that there's a lots of ways that microRNAs get into one's blood. One of them is from the microbiome, and we have no good evidence of any mechanisms yet that uh, are um, involved in, does, does the, do those microRNAs actually do something? Uh, in our bodies. We don't know. And it's also been discovered by several groups that some microRNAs from uh, things we eat in our food often gets into our blood. And uh, it turns out to be, for example, one of the, uh, one of the ways that babies get a lot of microRNAs into their blood turns out to be from mother's milk. Mm, mm. 
uh, the mother actually uh, secretes microRNAs into the milk, which is then ingested by the babies and is found in, uh, uh, in their blood, which is, uh, so there's an awful lot going on here of transmission of information that uh, we do not yet understand as a, as a, as a research uh, community. Yeah. Well, but it clearly could be important. One of the, the first things that uh, is simply being looked at is if you look at various body fluids and look at the microRNAs, can you tell something about what's going on? And we're actually doing a little work in that area. For example, um, we're collaborating with a group uh, looking at uh, cerebral spinal fluid, which is, uh, and, and looking at the microRNAs in there for Alzheimer's patients and for people with traumatic brain injury. And it looks like there's an awful lot of information there that could turn out to be very, very useful. Yeah. And then another example that uh, my lab is working with Bill Hagopian on is we're looking at uh, blood microRNAs in uh, some of his patients that are pre-diabetic or have developed antibodies and are on their way to developing diabetes. And what we're looking for there are profiles of microRNAs that are potentially predictive of uh, uh, the onset of uh, type 1 diabetes, which wow. would be very exciting. very exciting. We have some indications that there is definitely information there, but it's too early to say that we're, we've been really successful. But I think it's, a, uh, it's, it's the kind of thing that's going to be very, very promising in the future. Fascinating. Well, David, we're, we're getting close to the end of our time, and I can't oh. let you go. I can't let you go with... Um, out asking you to uh, take a look into your crystal ball and <laughs> um, perhaps share some perspective on, on what, what, what's the future of genetics look like? We're, we're in the middle of this revolution of genetics. And um, uh, so what, what, what are the trends? What, what's, what can we look forward to in the next uh, decade or so with regard to the role of our genetics in both maintaining our health and the development of disease? Well, I think, that of course is a is a huge question, and uh, in the area of what some people call personalized medicine has become one of the major questions is what if we know everything uh, about the coding of information in our genome, what can it tell us <laughs> at the moment we 're not too good at uh, um, at reading it uh, in, a, in the way that tells us about uh, the health, future health, possible problems and so forth. But it is clear that the information is there and that there, it's uh, going to be very promising. So in some sense, the, the future of genetics, one of the major things that is going to happen is we're going to learn how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we're going to learn how the different variants all around our genome potentially interact with one another and that we can integrate them into some really important picture of health and disease and susceptibility and resistance to disease. And there are many examples of the way in which uh, genetic variants, even in humans, there are many examples in humans where a genetic variant that's known to produce uh, or to uh, be a risk factor for a disease can be compensated by a variant in another gene that blocks that difficulty. Or, uh, and, and that kind of what we call gene interactions is prevalent and it's the multiplicity in the genome is very, very complex and very, uh, uh, there are many, many kinds of interactions. Trying to understand that, I think, is the, uh, is the work of the next decade in genetics. And that's probably the major thing. 
okay. that yeah. I would think is going to be different. We're going to understand how multiple genetic variants actually affect various important things about our health. Well, um, we look forward to how your curiosity and the curiosity of all the other scientists around the world will help us uh, realize that, that future. Um, so we have just a couple minutes left. I'm gonna ask you, we got a couple of questions from the audience. I'm gonna okay. um, um, just give you, a, well, I'm gonna pose a couple of questions and unfortunately, because of time, we're gonna keep the answers relatively short. Um, so one of the questions is, uh, well, generally, what's been the impact of all the shutdown on science, the scientific enterprise, progress? Um, you know, what, 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 what are the impacts of, the potential impacts of, of the shutdown on the scientific enterprise? The short answer is, I can't really answer that question except for my lab <laughs> okay. and my group. Um, but and I can I can make some guesses on that basis and about you know on the basis of talking to my colleagues uh, at other places but and at PNRI. I think in many ways it hasn't slowed down at all. Uh, it uh, I mean our group instead of having our group meetings we all work from home so we can actually work. Mm -hmm. Mostly we work on computational. Uh, and mathematical things right now. Um, but I know some of my colleagues at PNRI actually are able, because of, uh, are able to carry on their experiments, their laboratory experiments as well. So we can continue our work and we have uh, regular get togethers by Zoom or Skype, uh, which is a little different, but the same information ultimately passes and it's, it's, uh, it's amazing how well this actually works. <laughs> good, 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 good. So, so, so like the rest of society, we're beginning, finding ways to, to cope um, successfully. All right. All right. Good. Okay. Um, well, you know, we talked a lot around the importance of, of federal funding, especially for basic science. And so one of the questions we have is, um, what can the general public do to help support that and encourage it and, and, and make sure it continues? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I think one of the major ways, it's not, a, it's not a direct way to make sure that happens, but I think the general public should understand what the funding agencies actually do. Uh, and, and that's possible. I mean, sometimes the federal agencies, including NIH, don't make it easy for people to understand what they do, but, uh, but many things can be understood. And so um, uh, in understanding the science and really uh, trying to understand the science and trying to understand what scientific enterprise means so that one can, uh, grapple with people who have no idea what the scientific enterprise means is probably a really important thing the public can do. And finally, of course, making sure that your congressman understand how you feel about uh, the future of, of, of science in this country and technology in this country, which is fundamentally dependent yeah. on continuing uh, federal funding. Yeah. for the benefits to come. Yeah. So it, it's kind of a, <laughs> yeah. there are many ways, some more direct than others. And I'm not sure which of those are the most important actually. <laughs> well, as we've talked about, it's not always possible at the early stages when curiosity is at its peak um, to know exactly what's gonna become and when that's, those breakthroughs are going to occur. Um, and uh, you know we're living that moment right now with uh, the response to COVID-19. And uh, yeah, hopefully um, if there is some sort of silver lining to what we're going through, it will be that the public writ large um, is once again, uh, understands and appreciates the importance of continuing to support um, uh, basic science as well as the, the, the translation of that science. So, um, Yes, on that note, David, thank you very much 
for sharing the stories and your perspectives. As always, I enjoy myself and I'm sure everyone on the, uh, uh, watching this also enjoying themselves. Um, for those of you in the audience who want to learn more about David Gallus and his work, you can go to our website, www.pnri.org. And um, yeah, support um, basic science. Um, and with that, uh, wish you all the best for the remainder of our rather soggy Earth Day. And uh, we'll look forward to our next uh, Science Matters uh, event. So thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you, John. David.